Hi, everybody. I, it's a great honor to be here and to talk to you today. And I must admit, this is the greatest act today, is I actually managed to come up here without falling off the stage. So um, I am here. I have the pleasure of actually introducing uh, some of what is gravity and some physics. Or I love astrophysics, so I can't help it. I'm going to put in a little bit about that, too. But um, let's get started. So I believe that most of us, all of us, have our own experience of gravity, right? We know that if we throw something out of the window, if you're up at um, you know, at least two stories high, you, whatever you throw out the window, it will fall to Earth, right? If you try to throw a ball, eventually, no matter how fast you, 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 you throw it or how far up in the air you throw it, eventually it'll come down to Earth, right? And if you jump off a platform, like if I did now, I would fall, right? Sometimes we have the scars and the bruises to show it but we have our own experiences of what gravity is. So gravity is what makes bodies fall, okay? Now, um, even if you cannot see or feel it yourself, there's also the opportunity to uh, hear the act of gravity. For example, if water is in the air, if it rains, well, the rain will come down and make noises, will make sound that you can identify as, this is actually an act of gravity, okay? Now, what if we didn't have gravity? What would happen? Well, actually, rain would not fall to Earth. Instead, the water droplets would be suspended in space, and they wouldn't move unless something made it move. Like, for example, if this astronaut was actually, you know, pushing that little droplet there, right? So you can just imagine how, how much fun it would actually be to be, uh, for example, on the International Space Station. They can make everything fly. They themselves fly around each other. Um, but what about the challenge of actually having a shower? What would you do then, right? I mean, but hey, wouldn't it be fun to chase the droplets, right? Um, at any rate, I know that they, actually, they don't actually have a shower. They just wash themselves with wet cloths. So you can appreciate the fact that you guys can have a shower because of gravity, all right? Now, why is it then that the International Space Station, the astronauts and whatever is in the space station is floating? And this is because the International Space Station is in free fall. What this means is that, as you can see here, if Earth is in the center, the, the International Space Station is in orbit around Earth. And what it means is that it's moving sufficiently fast tangential to the, the, the line that goes from Earth to the space station. It moves far, fast enough to the left, like where the, that green arrow is, to never actually, when it's in free fall, never actually fall up onto Earth, but it just stays in this orbit. And it will stay in that orbit unless something else would actually uh, make the um, space station changes orbit, like if you took some energy away or gave it some energy, it would just continue with that motion um, indefinitely, okay? Now, this is also what you probably also already know, that this is what keeps all the planets in orbit around the sun, and also each of these planets are in free fall around the sun. It's kind of cool, right, that we all actually in free fall, we're racing through space right now. Can you feel it? Yeah, it's kind of sad. We don't actually feel it. We don't, it's not like being in the roller coaster in Tivoli where we can actually feel the rush, right? But we're actually charging through space right now because the sun is also racing around the center of our Milky Way galaxy. It's just that we don't feel it, okay? But like these planets, they will continue to orbit around the sun indefinitely unless something disturbs this very, very fine balance of energy balance that we have with the planets around the sun. For example, in this case of the Hubble Space Telescope, you've probably heard of it, right? It's been orbiting around uh, Earth for about 30 years, giving us brilliant pictures of, um, of space, but it's in an orbit that's close enough to Earth that it's experiencing a very, very dilute version or, or part of our atmosphere. So very few particles per cubic meter 
but it's enough that it feels a little bit of a drag, slight breaking, so that once in a while, they actually need to fire rockets to put it in an, in an elevated orbit, because otherwise, if they didn't, at some point, it would start its freefall and actually land on Earth and not keep its orbit around uh, Earth. So that's just a, a, um, another act of gravity. Okay. Now, you probably also uh, have the experience of gravity every day. You know that if you've been standing too long, for example, in the, the queue to get into here, you're, you can feel that the weight of your body is actually putting pressure on your soles, and you feel tired in your feet. You kind of want to sit down. Then you sit down, you've been sitting too long, and you kind of want to get out of your seat because your, your backside is also kind of sore, right? So this is the act of gravity. Earth is pulling on you, so you feel heavy. But that's also good because that weight or that gravity is what makes your, your bones really strong and your muscles strong. And that means that you can jump around, you can play games. So, but if you then imagine, what if you were to go on another planet? Like here, what I have are all the rocky planets and also have the sun. So you can see just for comparison that if you were to weigh 60 kilos on Earth, what would you weigh on all the other uh, planets? As you can see, all the other planets, you would actually weigh less. Hallelujah, we don't need to go on a diet. We just need to go to Pluto, right? Anyways, but it could be fun. You've probably seen some of the astronauts go onto the moon, and they can jump around like it was, there was no tomorrow, right? Because their body is used to being on Earth, so their muscles are really strong, so they can very easily jump but they also go very slow compared to how they would jump on Earth. And that's because on the different planets, like on the moon, when you, if you were to uh, jump off a cliff, you would fall at a certain rate on Earth. But when you're on another planet that has a lower uh, gravitational pull, then you would fall slower. Okay? And as you can see, you'd fall the slowest if you were in Pluto. Okay? But that would really make it fun, right? Because if we could go to Pluto, that means that we feel like Superman. We could actually jump really high, we can run really fast, and we would really be careful not to jump too high, because we could actually, in principle, jump so high that we would leave Pluto. <laughs> so, um, but what if then? Think of it this way. What if we were actually brought up on Pluto, we lived all our lives there, our bodies accustomed to the gravity of Pluto, and then we came to visit Earth. What if that? What if our, our muscles were actually not strong enough to walk on Earth? Could we even lift our feet? Could we jump around? Just think of that for a moment. So maybe actually we were quite lucky to be born on Earth. Actually, I'm glad because then I can be here with you. So, all right, so what is gravity? So what I just mentioned to you is that we all have some sort of experience of gravity, right? But what is gravity really, okay? Now, you probably heard of this guy, Sir Isaac Newton, who back in the 1600s, he was watching, the, uh, watching um, nature, and uh, as a real scientist, he was making observations, and he noticed that the moon was following and on orbiting Earth, and he also noticed that, you know, apples could fall from trees. And then he, at some point, he put the two and two together and said, ah, it's the same gravitational force. And this is what we know now, is this equation, you might remember it from school, the fact that the gravitational force is the force between two objects with a mass, and it's proportional to the product of the mass, and then you divide by the distance squared. What it means is that if we were to take, for example, the green one could be Earth, and the brown one could be Moon, and we took and, and separated these two bodies by uh, double the distance, it means that the gravitational force would be weaker by a factor of four compared to before. So it's actually a, a force that has a finite reach, but at the same time, it also has a 
gigantic reach, because we know that Earth can actually pull on, on the moon, and we just saw before that sun can also keep all the planets orbiting around it. And galaxies, galaxies can actually affect each other on vast distances, it's millions and billions of kilometers distance. For example, our Milky Way galaxy has uh, an interaction with the, the, uh, the Andromeda galaxy. So the two galaxies, even if they're way, way apart, I mean, there's 200 million light years to Andromeda, but they still affect each other on, on such large distances. And it's really mind-boggling, how does gravity do this? Okay. Now, you probably also heard about this guy. So Albert Einstein, he was also not very comfortable with this concept of gravity working on large distances. Okay. So even today, on with our modern understanding of how forces work, if you look at um, nuclear forces, for example, there's actually a change of particles. And in that, in that particular um, uh, perspective, it's actually difficult to understand how gravity will work. Is this an exchange of particles under such, you know, on such large distances? It's difficult to, to quite understand, and it just kind of shows that gravity must be something else. And Einstein, he thought long and hard about this. And he then came up with the fact that it's no force. And that's, of course, the part that's really the harder part for us to understand. What he said instead, that this is not a force. What matter does is matter tells space-time how to curve. So matter curves space-time, and then everything else just moves in space. And if you have something moving on a straight line, it just follows the space. And if it curves, it follows space too. Okay? So here is an example where you see the sun to the left, and then we have a neutron star, which is you know, two to three times as mass, more massive as the sun, but it's only about 10 kilometers wide. So that means basically the inner city of Copenhagen, that's sort of the size of a neutron star. And a black hole is even smaller, but it's even more massive, so it's very, very compact. So the more massive and the more compact the object is, the more it will actually curve space-time. Okay. So, for example, if we have no mass in space-time, then space-time is just going to be flat. Okay. And if you were to roll, for example, a, a, um, or, or shine light through it, light would just continue on a straight path. And you can actually think of this trampoline here as space-time. You see it as flat, and I think if we put some light on it, we can actually see, you see it's flat. And that would sort of be equivalent to having our space-time here, there's no material on it, and if I were to roll a, a marble across it, it would go in a straight line, okay? Now, I'm going to do something that I might regret. <laughs> yes, you already know, right? So, oh, here we go. I wanted to do this all night, and I'm not at all nervous. <laughs> no. Okay, so the deal is here, as I don't know if you can see, I'm actually bending space time now, okay? And that's because I'm putting all my weight on a small spot, okay? Now, I have too much in my back pocket here. I'll, let me just get it out. Because if I were to sit down and lie down, you'll see I won't actually bend it that much, right? Now, Oh, it's too comfortable. I might fall asleep. Anyways, so, so one of the things I want you to pay attention to when the performers come onto the trampoline is exactly how they use the space and how they're actually making a, uh, what would you call it, like a simulation of space-time by how they actually bend space, okay? And how they do motion and how they do free fall and I'm going to stop here <laughs> because <laughs> otherwise it might just go really bad because I haven't practiced like they have. Okay, but as you can see here, what I'm trying to uh, illustrate here is that if you have something that's actually curving space and could curve it more than I do, because you have to admit, I didn't actually burn it that much, right? That's because 
I'm just realizing I'm not heavy enough. The first time in my life I'm not heavy enough. But what you see here is that if the space-time was flat, um, light would follow this path or, or, uh, an, or, or an object would follow a path that's along the dashed line. But because space is curved, it will follow space. It will curve around. So you can actually have light bend, right? We don't see curved time uh, or space-time curving unless we see light bending. And there is actually a word for that. We call it gravitational lensing. And Sir Arthur uh, Eddington, he heard about Einstein's theory, and he thought, I'm going to go out and test it. So he was the first one to test Einstein's theory, because he knew that in May of 1919, there's going to be a total solar eclipse. And that would help him, because what happens when if you have sun here and Earth is here, as we move around the sun, we're seeing the sun projected against different stars, depending on what time of the year it is. And he knew that the sun would be projected against the Hyades uh, cluster of bright stars in May. So, and then during that eclipse, if the sun goes in front of them, the light from those stars from behind would be bent. Okay? And then, if you have a solar eclipse, you'd block out the light from the sun so you can see the stars. So what he did was, it's sort of illustrated here only with a Hubble Space Telescope, but it's, it's showing that if you have a star behind the sun, the light was supposed to go in a straight line just towards you guys, but it's getting bent by the curvature of space, and it's going to uh, land in the telescope, but from the telescope point of view, it looks as if the star comes from that point to the right. Okay, so you see the stars actually move on the sky compared to the time when the sun is not in that position. So by comparing the position of the stars when the sun was in that position with when it was not, when it was in a different part of the sky, they could show that that shift of the stars' positions as they could see it from Earth was exactly what Einstein had predicted. And that made Einstein famous overnight. Okay? So this is what we call rotational lensing, and that actually illustrates that space does curve. Because one of the things that would be difficult to understand is how light that doesn't have a matter, it doesn't have a mass, how can you make that bend and go in a different way? Because gravitational force, as you remember, was a force between two massive bodies. One body that you know, could be Earth or Sun, but you'd have to have that other body also have a mass, and light doesn't have mass. So how can you make it you know, be, be affected by gravity? And you can only do that if space-time itself is curving. All right, and these are examples of, to the left here, where you're seeing is a very blue galaxy right behind the red galaxy, and the light is getting bent around that red galaxy, so we're seeing what we call an Einstein ring. And here on the left-hand side, you're seeing light from galaxies behind a big uh, group of galaxies that are also being bent. So you see all these galaxies being stretched out and being bent in, sh in weird shapes. So that's sort of like nature's own telescope. Now, if you were to look around the space-time around a black hole, it would actually curve very, very strongly. And it's just curved so strongly that, as you can see, I sort of made an il illustration at the bottom, that you can actually see what's behind the black hole. So, just in case you ever get to do hide and seek out in space, a black hole is not a good place to, to hide between or hide behind because you will ne you'll always be seen. As you can see, there is this animation of Earth that goes around an imaginary black hole, and you can see that in no time in its orbit, it's actually going behind the black hole, but in no time in that orbit do you not see it, right? Because the light is being bent so strongly. And that's exactly how they made that image from Interstellar movie. What you're seeing here is actually the backside of that um, disk of, of uh, gas that's around the black hole, but you're seeing, it actually makes you see behind the black hole. Okay. Now, so, Einstein says, matter curves space-time, but then space-time is actually um, uh, curving uh, or telling matter how to move, 
But what we see here is also that if you have um, some gravitating bodies that are in accelerated, if they're like, for example, orbiting around each other, then they will make ripples in space-time. They will make gravitational waves. Okay, and you've probably already heard that they have already detected some of these waves. And what are they really? We know of waves, like for example, if you look at a pond and you throw a rock in it, you'll see ripples on the surface. This is nothing like what we see for gravitational waves. It's different, because these are three-dimensional waves. So how does that work? Well, it is, it's not just making movements up and down, it's making movements like this at the same time. So if you can sort of see what's happening on the left here, you see a circle that sometimes gets squished, sometimes from top to bottom, and sometimes it gets squished the other way. So it's kind of oscillating this way. And you can see here in a very saturated animation of what happens to Earth when gravitational waves pass through. So it's not just seemingly on the surface, it's space-time itself that ripples, it's that sort of waves. It's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. It's really, really cool. <laughs> so what happens actually when you see black holes colliding? So these are the first experiment that was made when they turned off the gravitational wave detector. They found two, two big black holes that were spiraling in. Um, now, these are really, really tiny distortions. So, of course, what you saw with Earth there is really not what happens to Earth. It's just a really saturated. So, it's only tiny, tiny uh, distortions that are um, about the size of an atom. It's like on that scale. So, it's very small. So, it means that we can only really detect these gravitational waves for black holes because they're the most... Um, they're the objects that are curving space-time the, the most, all right? And it's only in the final stages of the in-spiral that we can see the signal that it's strong enough for us to see it. And so what I have there on the left is sort of an, an illustration of the oscillations as they come closer and closer to each other. They, they spiral in and then they coalesce. And what I have on the, the left here is sort of a similar, or actually the actual observations from two, two of the detectors that they had, so they could make sure that it was a real signal. And if you convert this to a sound, you'll hear this. So again, this is after gravity. And I want you to pay attention to when the performers come on stage, because part of their sound, at some point, you'll hear this too. But you may have to listen carefully, okay? So, um, oops, I think it's because we want to hear it again. Oh, oh, what happened here? All right, black holes, let's talk about black holes. This is where I get excited because this is what I do for a living. I actually try to weigh black holes for a reason I'll tell you in a minute. Now, you've probably already seen this. Let me just keep track of time here. You've probably already seen these images. Right? It's from the Event Horizon Telescope, where they took many telescopes across Earth, and they put together the signal so that they could make this really, really high-resolution image. And this is the size of a donut on, on the moon. All right? So it's that small. And not just, I mean, it's kind of sad. Yeah. It's sort of like a donut, too, but that was sort of, I guess, just a bad analogy. But what you're seeing here, what's really, really important, is that we're seeing light from gas around the black hole. If this was not a black hole, that, that shadow in the middle would be light. Because what, what black hole does is that anything that comes within its event horizon telescope cannot escape. So all the light that's closer in falls onto the black hole. And if it had a surface, if this was like a neutron star, a very massive neutron star, light would get reflected on that surface and it would be a lot lighter in the center. So this is the, the ultimate proof that what we're looking at in this faraway galaxy, in the very center of it, is a supermassive black hole. And the one to the right is actually the black hole in our own Milky Way galaxy. And it's actually exciting for us scientists to see that the one on the left is one of the most massive black holes that we know of in the universe. And the other one is our own Milky Way galaxy. Now, that is not very big on this cosmic scale 
for such a black hole, but it's ours. Okay. Yeah. It's ours. We have a, a real connection to it. But it, what it shows us is that even from the small black holes to the biggest black holes, they all look the same when we get really close to the black hole. When you kind of can stand there and look down in the abyss. So, what is really a black hole? Well, I sort of alluded to it. You probably know it already. If you have a gravitating body, you need, to, in order to escape the gravitational field of that body, you need to have a certain speed. We call it the escape speed. For Earth, it's about 40,000 kilometers an hour. Sun is 2.2 million kilometers a second. That's a lot. If you, you know. But what also happens is that you can, as you can see, if you have something that's very massive and on a small volume, this escape velocity becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And a black hole is really where the escape velocity exceeds gravity, or exceeds the speed of light. And we cannot have anything move faster than the speed of light, so therefore anything that comes closer than the event horizon will fall onto the black hole. And that's how we define sort of the extent of the black hole, is, is that that fictive limit where anything that comes closer will fall onto the black hole, because it can't escape simply. Um, but all the material lies in the very, very center, very, very far from the event horizon. And what decides the size of it is really just the mass. Okay. So just to put things in perspective, now, how massive is a black hole, really? If we took all of Earth and squished it to be the size of a, of a super cube, then Earth would turn into a black hole. And I think every time I go and have a coffee, I look at the Stuka cube, and it actually reminds me of how intense and how immensely, you know, the gravitational pull of a black hole. Imagine, you know, having Earth in your hand as a Stuka cube, okay? And the sun would only be six kilometers across, which is even smaller than a neutron star, because I told you it was about 10 kilometers, right? But it's very, very tiny, and it's very massive. So just to put things in perspective. But where are all these black holes? There's lots of black holes. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy, so I'm showing as an example. But there are lots of these tiny black holes, actually, um, all over the galaxy. And there's one very massive one sitting in the center of all galaxies. We know that now, because we've actually seen pictures of them. Um, now, black holes are also, I mean, because of their gravitational pull, they're some of the most um, powerful engines, and they're able to, to accelerate particles out to the vast distances and at, at, to the highest velocities, like close to the speed of light. And what you see here in the, in the white is, is a galaxy with the stars, and the red is plasma that's being shot out to six times the distances of the galaxy itself, to very, very large distances. That's how powerful they are. Now, all galaxies have a supermassive black hole in the center, but only some of them shine. Only some of them are accreting material, so we can see the light from them. Now, there are also the black holes that are powering quasars. You may have heard of quasars. And they're just really, really pow or really, really massive black holes that are accreting a lot of material and creating lots of light. And this light makes it very easy to see at large distances, because what you're seeing here are some galaxies with active black holes in the center at different distances. Those that are nearby, you can see the light from the stars, but as they move further and further away, you can see in the middle one, you see still a little bit of a fuss, but on the very right, you see only a point source. And this is how they appear to us. So they appear as stars, but we can see this very, very bright light. And we can actually see it all the way out to, if we go, when, when we look out into the universe, we look back in time, and we can see it all the way out to when the first galaxies were formed. And we can see these black holes out there, because they're sitting in very, very massive galaxies. And this makes it sort of like a lighthouse for us to see, OK, we need to go look at that galaxy there, or that quasar there, because that is telling us that there's lots of massive galaxies out where it is. And what we're hoping for now is that the new James Webb telescope that was just launched is going to tell us a lot more about how the first black holes were formed and how it lives with its galaxy, if it's even there at the time. Because one of the things that we know about black holes is that because of all the energy it can actually spew out again from 
the region around the black hole. All the gas is trying to fall onto the black hole, but some of it gets flown out again. And it can send out gas, it can send out plasma, but it can also send out a lot of energy into the host galaxy, the galaxy it's sitting in. And that can push the gas, it can heat the gas, it can prevent the gas from forming stars, so it can kill all star formation. And stars are the ones that make the, the heavy elements that you and I are made of. It's what makes life possible. So how the black holes affect their galaxy really, uh, is really important for us to understand in order to understand how galaxies evolve in the universe and how life was made as well. So that's why it's really important for us to, to know how heavy are the, these black holes, because it's the, it's the mass of the black hole that is the, telling us this, how big it is, but it's also how powerful it is, because it's all that gravity that is creating all this power. So this is where it comes in that how do you actually weigh a black hole, because it's black? How do you weigh something that's dark and doesn't shine? Um, black holes have three properties, and the mass is the more important, as I mentioned, because this just determines most of its properties. So this is where it comes back to gravity is really an important factor here. We can weigh almost anything in the universe by watching something orbit whatever object. It could be the moon around Earth. You can weigh the Earth that way. Or we can look at stars around the black hole or gas around the black hole. And how do you do that exactly? Well, we use what is called the Doppler effect. Maybe you've heard of it. And this is a kind of cool effect, because what it means is that if you have an object that's moving away from you, the light that comes from that object will be stretched. So it will be redder. Right? If you have an object that's moving towards you, those, um, the, the light will be pressed together, and the, the waves will have smaller distance between the crests and, and, the, and the dips, and that would actually make the wavelength shorter, so it would become bluer. So we talk about blue shift and red shift. And as light is actually traveling through space, when the universe is, is expanding, all that light is being red shifted. So light itself, because of what's happening in the gravity, can also change color. Okay. So what we do is that we look at gas very close to the black hole, and we can look at how the, the shift of this wavelength or of the light, the color of the light there, how it changes. We can see how it does that very close to the center, and that tells us how fast the gas is moving. So what I'm showing you here on the right is actually a, an example of the gas on the right-hand side. It's actually gas that's moving away from us, and it's doing that very, very, very far over to the right very close to the center, where the black hole is. And then it flips around and becomes very fast towards us, so it means it's moving at very fast velocities, very close to the black hole. And based on that, we've been able to weigh this black hole, and it's, it's the equivalent to 800 million times the weight of our sun. And this was one of the first measurements that was being made using the Hubble Space Telescope. So that essentially tells you how we are measuring the, um, or, or weighing the black holes. Whoops. OK. So just to summarize, when you are seeing this performance uh, in a minute, or actually in a half an hour or so, some of the things you have to, you know, when you're thinking about what is really gravity here, what's the act of gravity. So we talked about there's going to be free fall is the obvious one, maybe. But there's also these color changes that I just talked about. There will also be distortions because of space-time being distorted. And you're also going to see something like influence at a distance. And I, I kind of dare you to, to find that part of the performance where they are affecting each other at a distance. I think it's really cool. You can charge me on that. Now, there's also the other thing I said. Gravity can also make sounds. Obviously, if I fell off this platform, I'll make a very splashing sound. But there's also other ones, right? So as we talked about, there's going to be like water could be you know, dropping in a pond, or the little corpse from the black holes that are colliding. So these are some of the things that you can keep in mind as you're enjoying the show. And I bet that you guys are going to have a tolling experience. 
because I've seen the show and I think it's going to be a wild ride, so you guys just hang in there and enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs>